As software engineers, we're constantly told to design for reuse. After all, why should you be writing the same thing over and over again? And yet, throughout all my years of being a software engineer and building things, the number of times that I've successfully reused code that I built for that purpose can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Instead of bearing the fruits of these efforts, we're saddled with all of the overhead, the industrial design, the implementation, debugging, and so on, required to make a more general solution to a problem, only to never reap any of the benefits of doing so. Why is this, and what can we do about it? Hi, I'm John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. I've worked in industry for 30 years, including a big stint at Big Tech, working at companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google. I worked at universities, government, uh, research labs, and a variety of other places. I was a principal engineer for 15 years, and I was also a software engineering manager for 13. The domains I've worked in include operating systems, networking, games, web services, cloud infrastructure, distributed storage systems, and general distributed processing. What I'd like to do is tell you a bit about how in this environment we tried to code for reusability and how it didn't wind up working very well. In the end, I'll summarize with a set of principles that have been adapted slightly from my experience and which I believe apply today. Throughout the 90s, I was working as a software engineer in test at Microsoft, working on the Windows team. Our approach to software was to write most things in either C or a very conservative approach to C++ that avoided many of the parts of C++ that were either difficult to debug or introduced significant overhead. As a result, our C++ code couldn't use STL. STL, the standard template library, was the main library that provided reusable constructs like lists, hash tables, and so on back then. But it had a number of limitations and weaknesses, which meant that it consumed resources in a way that you couldn't necessarily control. It threw exceptions when it failed, and it tended to create a lot of copies of classes rather than resharing the same class definition. This made the code written with STL much more difficult to debug and much more resource intensive, and as a result, we were prohibited from using it. Instead, we'd make our own implementations of things rather than using STL. I worked in the Windows networking team for a while, and there we needed to have all the standard lists and so on. We couldn't use STL, which meant we had to look at making those implementations ourselves. My first step was to take a look and see what other groups within Windows had done. By this time, Windows NT had been running for about 10 years, and there was a huge amount of code in a bunch of different groups. Surely somebody out there had come up with a good implementation of reusable tables, lists, and so on that we could use in our implementation. So I started combing through the code. I looked all around, but I looked deepest in the networking team's code, which was already the product of hundreds of developers over those years. I found several implementations of lists, a few of which had been generically made with the intention of them being reused. I found that they had a number of assumptions in them, that the ratio of additions to lookups would be a certain thing, that uh, the information that was inserted in a sorted list would be randomly distributed as it was being put in, that uh, the list should scale up at certain times in certain ways, and so on. When you added all of these different assumptions together, you wound up with a structure that, even though it was trying to be generic, had an awful lot of luggage and didn't necessarily fit the needs of the scenarios that I had. Using the generic classes would have meant copying those classes and rewriting significant parts of them, so that was out. My next step was to take a look and see if I could find any specialized implementations of these types of data structures that were living in the network code and scenarios similar to my own that I could just copy and paste, or even better, that I could abstract out a generic implementation that met our needs and at least not introduce too much code for two teams to be using the same list structures. Again, I found the same sort of problems that uh, I'd seen in the generic code, which is the assumptions, the underlying assumptions about how the code would work, how much it could scale, and the rest of it didn't meet my scenario. In addition to that, it had the overhead of the extra things that they'd shoot horned into their custom implementation of the code. So I would have had to strip that out as well. So again, I wound up with a bunch of code that I couldn't use. I wound up implementing my own just for our code. That worked out okay for me. And this is, in fact, the pattern that I saw over and over again as I worked not only at Microsoft, but at other places, watching how code was put together, watching how people tried to reuse things. Now, in those days, open source wasn't widely accepted, at least at the commercial companies that I went to. So putting these libraries into an open source library and referring to them wasn't really an option. Even if it was, 
having too many external dependencies can be very dangerous. If you want to try and use open source software as part of your project, you have to be prepared to devote some of your developers to finding and fixing problems in that environment, making sure that it's solid enough for you. And uh, when I say implementing fixes, it's because your priorities and what's important for you to be able to ship your product may not necessarily match the larger community's priorities. This whole problem also made people tempted to bring their implementations of generic lists that match their expectations with them to other jobs, but of course you can't do that. When you're doing work on behalf of somebody who's paying you, typically they own the IP. You're not allowed to just take that code away and use it someplace else. Within the same company, they also tend to frown on taking that code, taking a dependency on that code, because they don't want to have to link to a different code base. And so the sort of the best you can do is copy the code and stick it into your code base, but it may be overkill for the scenario you're facing. This is part of how we wound up not having these reusable libraries, or at least not having them broadly adopted. You know, there, there's exceptions, there's always exceptions to these sort of things, but this was the rule that I found for my first 20 years working as a software engineer. It's not completely a horror story. Two things happened. The first is that the open source community got more and more traction, and some of the libraries and systems that they developed wound up being solid enough with a large enough engineering base that you could really take a, a dependency upon it and still be able to ship your product. Also, programming languages have continued to grow, especially the libraries and the utilities that are included with them. For example, now you've got great implementations of lists and hash tables and multi-maps and all kinds of different elemental data structures that are very useful for you, that are easy to reference from C++ or C Sharp or Java, whatever language you're working in, chances are you can find a supported, reliable implementation of these data structures that in the past you had to make yourself and then subclass and specialize. The languages are much better set up these days for this to just be part of the language rather than an extra painful thing that you have to do. So what have I learned from this? In almost every group, don't invest too heavily, especially up front, in trying to make reusable utilities and functions. It almost never pays off. In my 30 years, I, I don't think I ever saw it pay off. Although I have seen a few examples in industry that I wasn't directly associated with that worked out okay. Be very cautious about when you're writing something to get a job done thinking, you know, if I just wrote a little more around this and documented it, why it could be a standalone library that everybody would want to use. Ask yourself, why hasn't this been done in the last 30 years? Because the answer is going to either be because it's probably not worth doing, or it has been done many times and there's lots of good implementations out there. Both of those would sort of negate your motivation for wanting to make your own reusable library for it. Rather than making those libraries yourself for reuse, take a look at the needs of your project and find open source projects or other supported tools that you can use um, and take a reasonable amount of dependencies. Another problem that I've seen with larger efforts is they can wind up having links to 50, 100 different libraries uh, and open source utilities. You have to keep track of the bug fixes and the security fixes for all those different projects and recompile your stuff. When something critical happens in one of those, it may mean that you have to recompile and make a new release for the software you're developing. So you really have to balance how many dependencies do I want, how solid is the software versus making things yourself. From a coding perspective, it's usually best to use the intrinsic or the built-in functions that come with whatever programming language you're using. For example, generics, templates, what have you, as long as it meets the need of your system. You can always put a little mark by it saying, investigate later and see if there's any issues here that we need to make our own implementation. You can make rapid progress, and even if you have to replace that code later, it didn't take a whole lot of work for you to write it in the first place, so you're still very much ahead of the game. Summing things up, don't make code with the idea of it being reusable as the highest priority. Chances are that it's not going to wind up being used broadly. Instead, invest as much as makes sense for you to get some good near-term benefit from it. If you have uh, something you feel is a proven benefit you're going to reap in the short term, great, invest in that. But don't spend a lot of time coding and maintaining for something that may never get used outside. And even if you wind up being wrong, you can always genericize the specific implementation that you made for your code later when the need arises. So again, very little lost. You are prioritizing adding the functionality that's needed in the time and then prettying it up later if there's sufficient justification. And that's about it.
If you've been in industry for a while, what's your opinion about this? Do you agree or disagree with the idea of not making generic code with an eye towards reusability and instead focusing on getting your immediate job done? When have you been bitten by this or when have you been bitten by the opposite? I'd love to hear your stories and your recommendations down below. Thank you very much for watching and as always, keep on pushing forward. Hi, this is John. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing so you get notified of my future videos. Also, if you are interested, you might want to check out the video I have linked here. Thanks and keep on pushing forward.